Welcome to the museum at FIT's Material Evidence, Assessing Risk in Museum Collections Virtual Symposium. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. It is my honor to introduce Sara Scaturro, who will present the talk, Hideous Weepers, Morning Crepe in the 19th Century. Sara Scaturro is the Eric and Jane North Chief Conservator at the Cleveland Museum of Art. We thank the US Institute of Museum and Library Services as this project is made possible by a grant from IMLS. We hope you enjoy the show. So thank you so much, the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to be talking about morning crepes sepulchral style. So morning crepe symbolizes death. Fashionable throughout the 19th century, it was a crispy, crinkled, and dull black silk fabric required for Victorian mourning customs. These requirements dictated that widows fully obliterate their body and face by draping themselves in yards of crepe for two years. The fabric's mere presence as a simple strip tied onto an arm, a hat, or a doorknob communicated non-verbally to the observer that the shadow of death had visited. Crepe was detested and yet much sought after, and it generated an ambivalent discourse about its expense, poor quality, and health effects. At the same time, it generated hard profits for the manufacturers, morning shops, and importers who leveraged the fact that death always happened. American etiquette expert Mrs. John Sherwood called crepe, quote, a most costly and disagreeable material easily ruined by the dampness and dust, a sort of penitential and self-mortifying dress and very ugly and very expensive, end quote. Perhaps you are wondering what my talk has to do with the subject of this symposium. After all, surely the materiality of this fashionably ugly silk fabric is benign within the context of our preservation practices. Well, you'd be surprised. The story of morning crepe, how it was made, sold, and used, reveals the pernicious character of this most reviled yet necessary fabric that haunts our fashion collections and harms possibly even us caretakers. Before I discuss crepe, we need to first understand Victorian mourning practices. In the United States, it was known that the English were the consummate practitioners of mourning and thus provided the example that Americans sought to emulate. The entrenchment of mourning etiquette in England reached its apotheosis in the second half of the 19th century, influenced primarily by Queen Victoria, who had adopted mourning dress for the remaining 40 years of her life after her husband, Prince Albert, died of typhoid in 1861. Her overt sartorial sign of loyalty was an example copied by many of her middle-class subjects and had widespread impact beyond the borders of Great Britain, especially in the United States. Textile and fashion historian Lou Taylor, who in 1983, what is still considered today as the definitive history of morning dress, declared that, quote, the importance of the royal influence on Victorian morning etiquette was supreme, end quote. And she likened Victoria's cult of mourning to the story, The Emperor's New Clothes, since few subjects were bold enough to speak out openly against mourning's codified practices. These customs enacted fiscal and physical hardships through coerced, or sometimes eagerly adopted, sartorial strategies that focused on creating a dead, black, lusterless look. Crepe was the primary material used to initiate the visual metamorphosis from a figure untouched by death to one whom sorrow had visited. The wearing of mourning was a performative sartorial act. So performing mourning correctly induced anxiety, and in the United States, these anxieties came to the fore during the Civil War, when the massive loss of male life increased the number of women who had lost loved ones. During that time, fashion magazines like Godey's Ladies Book focused on how the state of mourning should demonstrate fidelity, piousness, and respect, and that glossy fashions were unacceptable for a chaste woman. There were degrees of mourning dependent upon proximity of the deceased. Women, and particularly widows, were the most heavily encumbered, required to wear deep mourning for two years at minimum. So deep mourning consisted of all black garments made of matte and lusterless materials, 
little decoration, and the assumption of almost floor-length black veils, often called weepers. Quote, as if our grief were measured by the depth of our crepe veils, end quote, lamented a Mrs. Mallon in Ladies' Home Journal. But grief was measured that way, for if a woman performed mourning to perfection, she was redeemed in the face of society. As Mrs. Sherwood advised, quote, it is a common remark of the censorious that a person who lightens her mourning before two years did not care much for the deceased, and many people hold the fact that a widow or an orphan wears her crepe for two years to be greatly to her credit, end quote. These trappings of woe ensured women were visual objects of pity and loss through their public suffering. A Quaker's journal, the Friends Intelligencer, strongly stated, quote, the dress is hideous. Nothing more thoroughly sepulchral can be imagined than a woman swathed from head to foot in folds of thick, black, gloomy crepe. No man could endure such a dress for a day, but many women assume it almost eagerly and enter upon a slow period of martyrdom, end quote. So this sepulchral woman was a dreaded sight that society simultaneously mocked, pitied, and judged. What remained unspoken, but had utmost importance to the entire premise of mourning dress, was that a woman who found herself without her husband's protection was possibly dangerous. She was single, available, and sexually experienced, thus contributing to the inherent instability of society. So by shrouding herself in crepe, she visually deflected males' gazes while viscerally repulsing their touch. One might think that the primary difference between mourning and non-mourning attire was the color black, but that was not always the case. Black was such a fashionable color in the United States during the latter part of the 19th century, and the silhouette of mourning clothes aligned with normal fashion garments so closely that a researcher today might have a hard time distinguishing whether a historic black dress they are studying is actually a mourning garment. A checklist of distinguishing features would include dull black woolen and mixed fiber cloth like bombazine and Henrietta, matte surfaced beads, and little trimming, while also noticing the absence of lace and shiny and highly trimmed surfaces. Since both color and line cannot necessarily differentiate a morning gown, there really is only one element in a garment that can confirm unequivocally whether it was for morning, and that is black crepe. So the highest quality and most sought after morning crepe was made by the English firm Courtaulds, which had several silk mills in Essex, England. The fabric was exported to the United States under the name Courtaulds crepe, English crepe, or even by its French name, crepe anglaise thus reifying that the best and most authentic way for an American to enact mourning was to follow the English. Yet crepe didn't begin in England. Crepe's manufacturing as a mourning fabric is traced to the second half of the 16th century in Bologna, Italy, and later France, and finally started in Britain when a Huguenot population fled there after 1685. Throughout the 18th century, silk manufacturers attempted to match Bolognese crepe, but made little progress until the Huguenot family of Courtauld's hit upon success by the early 1800s. So the manufacturing of mourning crepe was notoriously secretive, with every firm having their own methods, machinery, and recipes. The fabric was made in a multi-step process. First, the fabric was thrown into a high twist yarn using inexpensive waist silk, which was then woven into a plain gauze-like fabric. The woven fabric was put through an angling machine, which stretched the weft direction askew of the warp, which was a critical step since silk itself cannot naturally stretch well. Placing the fabric on the bias allowed the fabric to stretch and not break during the next step, which was the crimping stage that gave the fabric its recognizable texture. The last steps were dyeing the fabric black and then treating and coating it with a variety of chemicals that gave it its dead hue and crispy feel. While every manufacturer had their own method to create crepe and the process evolved over the 19th century, it is believed that Courtauld's equipment and approach to the biasing step created a better quality fabric. Exported to the US and France, Courtauld's capital and profits nearly quadrupled between 1843 and 1877, and by 1885, it was making virtually nothing but morning crepe. <laughs> 
Crepe was expensive, selling at twice the cost of other silk products. Its expense was often cited in the American press as a reason to moderate its use, since those who could not afford crepe were pressured to purchase large quantities during a time of despair. A widow who had just lost her husband might also have lost her sole source of income, and yet she was expected to wear dull black garments covered in primarily crepe for two years after his death. As an example of price, this 1877 spring-summer mail-order catalog for the department store Lord & Taylor sold veiling crepes costing from $2.50 to $9 a yard. While crepe yardage might not seem expensive in comparison to full ensembles, which cost anywhere from $20 to $40, Deep Mourning prescribed a woman cover her black gown completely in crepe, use the fabric as self-trimming, and then purchase additional crepe for her nearly floor-length veils. And a quarter yard deep hem was also required on the veils, thus meaning an accumulated amount of fabric that was at least four to five yards for just one ensemble which could cost the equivalent of a new dress. This 1895 cap and veil combination by Wanamaker's department store held in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection has a veil measuring seven feet in length by three feet in width with the standard deep hem. And thus it exemplifies the extensive outlay of monetary resources for crepe that deep mourning required. Compounding the expense of crepe was its poor resilience. While a prudent mourner might have sought lower priced crepe, in the long run, that decision would have been even more financially ruinous since the fabric quickly spotted with moisture, faded with light, tore with handling, and completely lost its hand and texture when wet. An advertiser and Godies trumpeted the quality of their crepe as compared to crepe by other manufacturers that after becoming, quote, wet, is absolutely ruined. It is limp, out of shape, disgusting to look at, and quite beyond the power of restoration, end quote. The term rusty was used to indicate crepe that had begun to lose its deep black color and stiff drape, and women were judged harshly should they go about in rusty crepe. Godies cautioned widows that, quote, veils bordered with a wide fold of crepe on each end are very perishable and soon look defaced, a thing to be guarded against in mourning for shabby black is an abomination and had better be left off altogether, end quote. In adding insult to injury, while a prudent person might want to store crepe to be used again the next time they were in mourning, Crepe manufacturers and sellers stressed the superstition that it was unlucky to keep crepe in the house when not in mourning. And yet it gets even worse. Sustained exposure of the skin, the body's largest organ, to a vast extent of a highly processed material like crepe for a period of up to two years produced both physical and psychosomatic effects that were taken up in the American discourse. This advertisement, found at an 1878 Harper's Bazaar, offered to remove arsenic and bad odors from morning crepe, as well as refurbish rusty crepe so that it not only looked new, but it could withstand dampness and even sea air. And without mincing words, Lippincott's monthly magazine advised readers in 1870 that, quote, there is poison in crepe. It sometimes produces eruptions and disease. There is poison in bad air. There is ruin to the eyes, in the exhalations and in the diagonal lines of the dark and heavy veil, end quote. This warning of crepe's noxious and encompassing effects, you know, the fabric damaged skin created a miasmic environment, made the eyes strain to see through it and passed on contaminants on every breath exhalation. In 1886, Harper's Bazaar told its readers that, quote, this fashion is very much objected to by doctors who think many diseases of the eye come by this means since it sheds its pernicious dye into the sensitive nostrils, producing catarrhal disease as well as blindness and cataract of the eye, end quote. And Ladies Home Journal advised their readers to air their morning dresses in a shady place every two weeks since, quote, Crepe always will have a peculiar scent, no experiments having yet removed it, end quote. And they also told their readers that, quote, in these days of physical culture, we are wisely taught that our first duty is to care for health, and it is suicide for the delicate woman to wear very deep mourning during warm weather. <laughs> 
end quote. So was this true? Was this disagreeable fabric not only expensive, fragile, and ugly, was it also poisonous? Well, this was a question that curator Jessica Regan and I asked when mounting the 2014 exhibition, Death Becomes Her, at the Costume Institute in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We chose nine objects from 1870 to 1900 that featured crepe fabric, including veils, bonnets, and full ensembles. We analyzed the objects through carrying out polarizing light microscopy, which is a destructive technique since it requires a small amount of fiber. We also sought to use X-ray fluorescence since it is a non-destructive technique that could detect the elemental composition of any object and potentially point towards any hazards. So first, the conservators at the Costume Institute carried out polarizing light microscopy using the lab's own equipment. Our analysis of the morphology of the fibers through polarized light microscopy revealed silk filaments with significant accretions of the finishing solutions applied to harden and dull the fi fiber surface. This has a haptic effect as these heavily coated and twisted silk fibers make the fabric scratchy, coarse, and heavier to wear in complete opposition to the smooth, airy silkiness we usually conjure up when we think of the silk fiber. These accretions also give us a hint that perhaps there might be something to all of the cautions against wearing morning crepe. Since portable X-ray fluorescence equipment is expensive and used specifically for identifying inorganic materials rather than organic, the Costume Institute Conservation Lab did not own a portable XRF unit. However, the CI conservators were fortunate to work with colleagues in the Department of Scientific Research at the Met and specifically the scientist in charge, Marco Leona, to test each of the objects in several locations. Testing can be difficult since morning crepes are usually sheer, meaning that whatever was located below the object could impact the spectra. So you see here the unit facing up with the morning crepe placed on top so that only the crepe itself would be analyzed. And indeed, the XRF results were alarming. All objects contain lead, iron, and copper, and some also had mercury, bromine, and palladium. Iron and possibly copper, lead, and bromine might be expected given they are mordants used for dyeing darker colors like black. But the addition of mercury and palladium are unexpected in fashion garments. And of the nine objects, one was actually found to contain arsenic, and I've highlighted that one here in red. These inorganic chemicals are toxic and almost certainly impacted those workers who made the crepe fabric. There are also potential health ramifications for wearers, including skin rashes, weeping eyes, congestion, respiratory distress, as well as neurological and psychological problems caused by systemic exposure. And this kind of exposure is a possibility if a woman was wearing the chemical-laden fabric over her face for two years to follow deep mourning requirements. While there is a slight chance these chemicals were added to the objects after they entered the collection, it is almost certain that these elements resulted from the complicated and confidential dyeing and finishing processes used to make mourning crepe. Regardless of how these chemicals came to be in the fabric, our analyses showed that mourning crepe is not benign. Caretakers of mourning goods, specifically crepe, should handle these objects with caution. As mourning crepe ages, the silk and brittles and breaks, causing dust and small fibers to collect on work surfaces and in storage containers. So caretakers should use gloves and respirators to protect themselves from this particulate and use a high quality HEPA filtered vacuum to remove particulate where possible. These precautions should enable morning crepe to remain safely in our collections while still being handled with care. So in conclusion, I invite you to think about who might have worn the morning crepe dresses and veils we conserve. How can we understand their embodied experience of the fabric? Let's think. How must it have felt to wear this hideously ugly, uncomfortable and fragile fabric every single day for two years. What would our eyes have seen as we strained to look through the crimped black veil 
what would our noses have smelled as we dropped the veils over our faces to go out into public? What kind of air would we have breathed as our body heat and breath warmed the crepe fabric? What would go through our minds as we calculated the need to replace yet another expensive crepe veil, which had gotten too quickly ruined? And lastly, how would our spirits have shown resilience? especially when our shrouded, sepulchral figures made people pull away from us as the visible symbols of death. Thank you.